Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tiger Global Case Competition 2020 competitor exclusive workshop on developing your deck and pitch. What an exciting week. We are absolutely over the moon that we've launched the TGCC 2020 on Friday. So as you would know, Friday kicked off with six regional Meet Your Judges session, which was sessions, which were so exciting. Um, how great are our judges this year? They are really, really looking forward to seeing all of your solutions and presentations. Um, and then of course, yesterday, the case was released. The regional case was released. How exciting. All right, guys, so we're gonna keep it going. Let's see, all right. Let's look at some dates. All right, so everybody, if you can take out your cameras and take a picture of the screen, these are gonna be some really key upcoming dates. All right, guys? So later on today, we have a live Q&A with the CFO of ACSL, the regional case company. Really, really special. All right, so on the 12th of September, your regional cases are due and you'll need to submit those digitally. On Monday, September 14th, of all the electronic cases that were submitted, then we'll announce who the top 10 teams in each region are. Now, the top 10 teams in each region are invited to the global final round. Very exciting. So you'll find out if you're one of those top 10 teams on Monday, September 14th. Now, from Monday till Saturday, you and your team have the opportunity to practice your presentation to then present to a live panel of judges on Saturday, September 19th. Now, on Wednesday, September 15th, we're also bringing you another TGCC 2020 competitor exclusive workshop to help you set up delivering your pitch and to help practice your presentation. All right, guys, but for today, all right, we've got developing your deck and pitch. Guys, this is so exciting. We have Benjamin Chung with us. Now, Ben has a track record of investing and building successful internet-related businesses. And he's been doing this for over 20 years. So look, his day in and day out today, he spends as a partner at the venture capital firm, firm Right Click Capital. Now, Ben is also the director and founder of, he's the director of the Founder Institute in Sydney, which is the world's largest pre-speed seed startup accelerator. So guys, Ben listens day in and day out to people pitching their ideas to him so that he will invest. So who better to help you guys work through how to develop your deck and pitch than Ben himself. We are absolutely over the moon to have him with us today. All right, guys. So we're going to drop a poll. If you guys want to tell us where you're where you're tuning in from, just so that we have an idea. I will give you guys some time to answer that. Yes, all right. I see Australia, New Zealand, EMEA coming in hot and heavy, guys. Amazing. Brilliant. I'm so glad to see we have so many people on the line. Um, this is definitely a workshop that you certainly don't want to miss. I can tell, you know, some of our friends over there in um, Central South America and North America are tuning in in the middle of the night. So that is great to see, guys. Super, super pumped. All right. We've got most of the crowd from about 100 from Australia and New Zealand, about 100 from South Southeast Asia, uh, about 25 from North America, looking at about 50 from Central America. Very cool, guys. Awesome. All right. Well, without further ado, let me just put this up on the screen, guys, really quickly. So Ben just wrote this super amazing article, The Nine Boxes All Founders Need to Tick When Pitching, straight from an investor's mouth. So we sent you this link in the email before the webinar, and as well, uh, one of my colleagues is going to drop it in the chat. So you definitely have to check out this article. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it along to Ben. Welcome, Ben. 
Hello, Kerry. Thank you for having me. And I'm very, very excited to have the opportunity to have a chat with you about creating a winning presentation. So all of you have been given details of the case, and I understand you've got a finite number of slides that you need to prepare in response to the case. So best wishes to you. I'm hoping that I can share some of the things that I have seen work and perhaps work not so well over the last couple of years. And I'm hoping that by employing some of these techniques, you'll be able to create a presentation that's very clear, that clearly communicates what you wish to get across and hopefully win or at least become a finalist. So we'll be covering the three things today. And if you move to the next slide, please, Kerry, we'll be talking a little bit about practicing, because practicing is very important, as is preparation. And I think the very first thing that I think about when preparing a presentation is the storyline. What is the story that I am going to be telling? And how can I frame this story and present this story in a compelling fashion? The second thing we're going to talk about today is using strong argumentation to ensure that your storyline hits the mark. And I'll bring you in on a little, little topic of the pyramid principle. And in fact, you can see the source there at the bottom of the of the slide, which is a great book if you can get your hands on it. So we're talking about argumentation. How do you construct arguments that are logical and that support your story? And then the third thing that we'll be having a look at today is structure. How do you structure individual slides? How do you structure all the slides for optimal communication? So let's turn to the storyline. I think with the storyline on the next page, it's about bringing your audience on a journey. If you think back about good stories, you'll know that if someone says to you, once upon a time in a distant, faraway galaxy, they'll be referring to a fairy tale or something that is make-believe. And a compelling storyline grabs the attention of your audience. So as you're going through the case, and if there's a recommendation or an overarching theme that you wish to draw to the attention of the judges, create a compelling storyline that grabs their attention and hits them between the eyes. Now, in thinking of stories, stories have a number of common elements. There are characters, Sometimes you'll have protagonists. Other times you'll have antagonists. <laughs> There'll be the setting. Is it a, a current situation or something in the past? Or are we talking about the future? Another element of a story is the plot. Are we going from A to B and then to C? Good stories also have conflict. Do we choose the color red or do we choose the color black? Which button is going to open the door? That's the suspense. That's the potential conflict. And of course, if the right button was pushed, then we get to resolution. And as mentioned before, a theme is very important for a story. So as you go through building your story, I think post-it notes are a wonderful way for you to lay out perhaps a point on each of these post-it notes. And because the post-it notes allow you to change the position <laughs> without being caught up, you're able to lay out your story with post-it notes. Lay it out on a grid so that you're able to have the opportunity to express yourself, but also change if necessary. Now on the next slide, I wanted you to be aware that you need to communicate your recommendations effectively. So like a newspaper article, when preparing one of these presentations or decks, you will want to start 
with the headline. That's what grabs your attention, the big font. Then when you read through a newspaper article, after the first paragraph, there'll be more information. And if you're keen, you can read the third paragraph and the fourth and so on. And if it's a long, long article, as you keep reading towards the end of the article, there'll be more and more details. So my recommendation is that you structure your presentation with a clear headline. Each slide, in fact, should have a clear headline. You'll have arguments, there'll be logic, which supports these arguments, and then you'll have an appendix. Now, the good news is that I'll be taking questions from you. So if you've got any questions, make a note of them now. And if I don't answer them over the course of this presentation, I hope that we'll have time to be able to get to all of your questions. So when you read a newspaper headline, the conclusion is there. Robber found so-and-so guilty. Interesting news. That is the headline. And I suggest that you begin with the conclusion first. And once you've got the conclusion out, present your supporting arguments. I think that's one of the big things in business communications. Yeah. We're not having this punchline all at the very end of the presentation. No, it should be in bold at the beginning. On the next slide, I wanted you to, I wanted to share about building your story. So you want to build your story with the situation and also the complication. And I think this situation complication resolution framework is really important. So a situation is a recognized and stable situation that everyone agrees with. So the example here is smartphones have improved the lives of many. I think people recognize that and people probably agree with that. So that's a recognized and stable situation that people can nod their heads to. The second thing is a complication. This is where you might raise a question or change to the status quo. Now, did you know the cost of smartphones in developing countries is still prohibitive to a large portion of the population? Hmm. So that's the challenge, the complication. And what's the resolution? A response that will hopefully capture, alleviate or resolve the complication. What about if we were to develop a low cost smartphone that can be distributed, can be sold, can be marketed in developing countries. So as you come up with your potential story, have a think about how the situation, the complication and the resolution framework might apply. On the next slide, you'll see that you don't always need to use situation, smartphones, Complication in developing countries, resolution. How about a low cost smartphone? That's the classic structure. You could mix it up. You could start off with the resolution. We ought to build low cost smartphones because they improve the lives of many and will be able to help a lot of people in developing countries. Hmm. That's the resolution, the situation and complication. Or you could turn it on its head. Did you know that a very large percentage, the majority of people in developing countries don't have access to smartphones? Hmm. Now, smartphones have improved the lives of many. And I recommend that we develop a low cost smartphone so that folks in developing countries can benefit. So that alarming start can create a sense of urgency and have people's ears prick up and listen to what you are trying to put forward. Now, I wanted to move from storyline to argumentation. Now, on the next slide, I want you to know that it's important to communicate clearly 
with the pyramid principle. What is this pyramid principle? Well, you have the key takeaway, the headline at the top. Then you have your first argument, perhaps some sub arguments and some data to support each of those sub arguments. Then you've got the second argument and then you've got the third argument. A lot of business communications and presentations that I've seen over the years benefits from this pyramid structure because it allows the reader or the listener to get the key takeaway. Huh. I agree, disagree. And then here, what was the reason? Reason one, reason two, reason three. And hmm, what are some of the sub reasons? Sub reason 1.1, sub reason 1.2, and the data that goes along with it. So why don't we turn to an example? Here's the pyramid principle in action on the next slide. Jill is a great friend, a wonderful friend. She's a great fan because she buys me gifts. She enjoys the same sports as me. She always has a listening ear. So you can see the key takeaway is Jill is a great friend. First argument, she buys me gifts. Second argument, she enjoys the same sports as me. Third argument, she has a listening ear. Now, why don't we have a shot thinking what could be some of the sub arguments? Jill is a great friend. She buys me gifts, like that amazing birthday present of chocolates, my favorite chocolates, and that Christmas present where she got me a remote control car. Hmm, there's some sub arguments. She enjoys the same sports as me. She loves the cricket, and she also enjoys netball. Hmm, same sports that, that, that I enjoy. She has a listening ear. When I was having a terrible time with my brother, she, she listened to me. And also, when I feel no one else can understand me, she's prepared to listen. So they would be the supporting arguments to the gifts, to the sports, to the listening ear. Now, You'll notice that there's a structure here. Jill is a friend, she buys me gifts, sports, listening year. One of the other things that I've noticed in business over the years is that it's important to gather your points and group like ideas. So on this next slide, you'll see what I call the MISI framework. And this is a framework that stands for Mutually Exhaustive, M-E, Comprehensively Exhaustive. In fact, it should be Mutually Exclusive, apologies, and Comprehensively Exhaustive. So let's take an example here. There's a grocery list. Banana, bread, muffin, ice cream, fish fingers, grapes, croissant, frozen nuggets, and strawberry. Well, what's a way that we could group these grocery list items? Well, we could have bakery and the three items within the bakery section, bread, croissant, and muffin. Then we could have frozen food, fish fingers, Frozen nuggets and ice cream, they belong together. Hmm, and fresh fruit, banana, grapes and strawberry. So what you can see here is that the items in bakery are mutually exclusive. They're separate and distinct from the items that are in frozen food, which are also separate and distinct from those that are in fresh fruit. And then it's also exhaustive. I think in the grocery list, there should be nine items. And then there's three items in each, bakery, frozen food, and fresh fruit. So when putting together an argument or when putting together 
your information, I recommend that you make use of this MISI framework, mutually exclusive, comprehensively exhaustive, so you can separate things logically. And by grouping these ideas, you'll, able, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to, to mount a stronger argument. So order your ideas logically within each group. Now, on the next slide, I want you to see that when building a presentation and coming up with the answers or an argument, it's important for that to answer the what, the why, and the how. It's a little bit like a, a story. You might remember the, the, the writing a story will have the who, what, why, where, when. I think when it comes to the arguments, a good argument should answer what? What are you talking about? Why are you talking about it? And how? And the other important thing is the so what? So you've told me all this stuff. You've given me all this data, all this information. So what? What do I do with that? What is the implication? What is the action that you want me to take or the decision that you wish for me to consider? Very important things. So headings should summarize the, group, uh, the grouped arguments below. And we'll be going through an example very shortly. So this Q&A and the so what should be embedded within your logical pyramid. And you can see this on the next slide. Your arguments, as you go through your arguments, you should answer the Q&A of the what, why, and the how. And as someone sees the surface of the argument, the so what should be relevant. Let's go to the next slide for an example. You can see here on the right-hand side a statement which says, civil society, governance and infrastructure have strongest correlations to financial inclusion. That's the key takeaway. What are the arguments here? Well, civil society, okay? Governance, infrastructure. And then they talk about the data or they illustrate the data. So you can see the correlation there between public safety and gender equality, between corruption and rule of law, and between internet and electricity. Interesting, huh? So the lower levels support the key takeaway. And this is that pyramid principle in action where you've got the key takeaway, you've got the arguments, then you've got the sub arguments if necessary, and then the data. Cool. So we've spoken so far about the storyline. We've discussed argumentation, how to build these arguments, and we've explored how to make use of the pyramid to build those arguments. Let's now turn to structure and polish. Here, my suggestion is that if you polish your slides, you'll be able to maximize their impact. And here are five tips that I suggest you consider to have your presentation hit its mark. Firstly, make each heading count. So your headings should be clear, they should be consistent, they should have meaning. Secondly, use graphics, colour and fonts to draw attention and provide signposts. So you can see, for instance, in this 
presentation, we're in the third third because the three arrows at the top right, top left hand corner of the three arrows, the, the, the third one is a, a little darker than the first two, indicating that we're in the, the last third of the presentation. Third tip, simplicity is key. Sometimes less is more. Fourth one, ensure consistency of colour, font and alignment throughout. When you read a newspaper, when you read a magazine, when you go to a well-produced website, visually things look right. And I urge you to do the same with your presentations. Number five, include notes, sources and page numbers so that if you are making reference to something, you can say, hey, that's on page five. And if you're making a claim, particularly in relation to data, well, it's good to, good to cite the source of that data. So in this case, it could be the company's annual report, or it could be the, the company's media release. So they're the five tips. Why don't we see how these five tips are employed in action? On the next slide. So we've got a clear heading. This is the response from someone's current girlfriend, the presenter's current girlfriend. And the arguments are there's a clear disconnect between customer needs and existing service and a conclusion. <laughs> you can see that the takeaway is in this slide, highlighted at the bottom, I'm out of here. And you can see that there's a demonstrable logic. So uh, comparison using a stacked bar chart of what this person believes she provides, the girlfriend provides, and what the preparer of this chart believes they need. And you can see that it looks like the girlfriend provides a lot of analysis, but not so much love. <laughs> and the preparer of this chart wants a little less analysis and a lot more love. And then you can see the, the conclusion. The relationship has been weakening, long-term prospects are dwindling, Road roadblocks are here today, speak in English, not in slides. You can also see that it's quite well spaced and aligned, and there are some source and page numbers. So there are some of the five tips in action. Now, before we get to q and I wanted to show you another slide, and this relates to charts. Data charts can be a very powerful illustrative device in presentations that you create. Here is a summary of the types of charts and the usage of those charts. So for uh, illustration of components, a pie chart can be very useful or a column chart, and in this case, this is a column chart come, come waterfall chart that can be very, very useful to, to demonstrate what the, the components of, of, a, of, a, of a business's line, line, of, line of business or a profit and loss, particularly with the, 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 the component column chart that can be, be waterfall chart that can be very useful. If you're wanting to illustrate, say, the distribution of an item, I think a bar chart is very useful. If you're wanting to illustrate something over time, so how was performance in 2017 compared with 18, compared with 19, and compared with 20? A column chart is very useful, and you can use it in a block light column or more of a line chart. Frequency, how many times have 
has a particular product or service being bought, well, that's a column and uh, a line chart, particularly if you're showing uh, distribution. Correlations, it's a bar chart. And then correlations can also be illustrated, as we saw before, using the, the dots. So if you're interested in learning more about how to make the best use of charts to bring your point across, then there's a great book there that I've sourced called Say It With Charts. So that brings the formal portion of my little presentation to the end. And it's now time for Q&A, which I'll get Kerry to help host. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ben. That was so helpful. Um, we have questions flying in the chat. Um, so all the, the participants are very engaged. Um, just to introduce myself real quickly, I was so excited I forgot. My name's Carrie. Um, I'm your host for today. I'm actually tuning in from Melbourne, Australia, um, and Ben is tuning in from Sydney, Australia. Um, so welcome again to everyone. Um, if you logged on uh, a little bit later, we're super excited talking about developing um, your pitch. So all right, without further ado, I know we've got lots of questions coming in. All right, the first one from Shivan. Should we, for our storyline, set up an ideal world or introduce and elaborate on the ways our solution will impact the world and the company alike? Mm, good question, Shivan. I'd say that for your storyline, particularly for a case, you want to come up with your conclusion pretty promptly. So if the conclusion is that the company needs to sell off particular assets, that should be the, 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 the big point. And then there will be a whole bunch of arguments around why and how you'll do that. Now, I think the, the, the key, Shivan, is to, is to be very clear and not to talk in, in too much motherhood and, and fuzzy logic. So an alternative is with, with the story, and, and we saw how you can introduce the situation, you can have the complexity and you can have the resolution. You can switch that around. So I'm not saying you have to always start with the, the, the conclusion or the, the resolution in, in that case, the SCR, and then you, 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 you can mix that around. But what I would suggest that for your, your storyline is you, you want to have a logic for, we believe it's X, we believe the company should do X, or we recommend that the company seriously look at X, and these are the reasons why A, B, C, D, E, F. And of course, these are the ways that the, 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 the company will, will impact the world. Beautiful. What a great answer. And that was a great question, Shivan, for sure. All right. Um, from Siddharth, how do you find a balance between a sufficient amount of content on each slide without making the slide too complex or crowded? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. I think this is a, a battle that I face a lot of the time when I'm trying to present information. I think there is sometimes the, the, the desire to share so much and if there's a limit to the number of slides that you have, you, you, you want to jam more and more into a slide. I would suggest that I would suggest that when creating these slides, it depends what the what the purpose and the audience is. Generally speaking, if it is a slide that I will be talking to, as in presenting, I will have less words on that slide. Whereas if it is a slide that I am going to be sending to someone by email, that will generally have more words on, on the slide. So a report that I'm preparing for somebody 
to send by email will have more words, generally speaking, than one that I'm presenting. Because it's very difficult to, to, I think, get the attention of people to present with there's lots of, and there's lots of words because the eyes will be trying to interpret everything on, on, on the slide. I would suggest that on most slides, you can have that page divided into three thirds. You may even be able to have it into four quarters like we saw, we, so we saw three thirds before there. You might be able to do four quarters, but I think it, it depends on what are the components that of, of, of your slide. So if, if we saw before we, on that financial inclusion slide, there were three charts, you could probably put three or four more charts mm -hmm. if they were exactly the same in terms of the, the, the layout and the, the, the type of content. But if you're changing the construct and the changing the types of charts I think it's very difficult to have more than more than two or even three of of, of, of a different type on a, on a slide. So I hope that's helpful, Siddharth. Oh, there's another question here from forward slash oblique. Can I just, Ben, do you mind if I jump in just for one second, just to remind all the competitors um, that so the slide decks are submitted electronically first, um, and then the top 10 teams from each region are selected to present. So make sure you kind of keep your eye on that balance of not too much information, but enough information to get you through um, the first stage. So definitely, you know, splitting up your sides like Ben had suggested. Um, but and it will be those 10 slides that if you are one of the finalists that present, you do still have to use those same slides. So just keep that in mind when, when you're creating them. Cool. So awesome. Ethan, take it away. Thanks. Forward slash. As an investor, how would you like financial data to be presented to you? Again, it depends. I think graphically, financial data is usually very helpful. So if you're representing profit with a bar chart in 2015, it was this and it went up in 16 and 17. That's quite nice. And it, it depends if you're, you're wanting to zone in on a, on a, on a particular area on a, or a particular component. Sometimes with financial data, I'm very happy to, 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 to look at lots of numbers. But I would suggest that if you're making a presentation and there are lots of numbers on a page, then you use a call out or a, a circle to draw the attention of the reader to the pertinent elements. So let's say you've got a profit and loss statement over multiple years and you want all the numbers to appear and there's one or two numbers that have changed a lot. Well, you might have a, a circle and a call out which allows you to draw attention and have some commentary related to that particular change in the financial data. Brilliant, thank you, Ben. Um, one that I think that we have seen a few times, um, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen when presenting or when someone is presenting to you? I would say that, I would say that inconsistency is, is, is a problem. So if let's say, we are going to convince people that blue is the best color. Vote blue, vote blue, vote blue. But then there's some slide which somehow talks about red. Well, that's really weird. Why is that appearing there? And I think it, it therefore means that if there's a claim made that smartphones help people do X, Y, and Z, well, you want for that argument and that logic to be consistent over the course of your presentation instead of sometimes it's for ABC, other times it's for EDF, and then other times it's X, Y, Z. No, 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 if it's X, Y, Z, it should be X, Y, Z throughout the presentation. So consistency is important. Yes, I think that's a good life lesson, right, Ben? Mm -hmm. Consistency is important. <laughs> 
Um, okay, we have one from Ian. Ben, if you don't mind, could you share a story of your best time that you are presenting a product to a crowd? I'm loving the presentation, he says. That's very kind. I think when giving a presentation to a crowd, it is helpful to share your energy, your passion, and in fact, some emotion with the crowd. So like a story, we are speaking about that before, you want for there to be a, a suspenseful moment, you want for there to be a, a variation. If someone is talking to you like this all the time, it's going to be very difficult for you to be engaged. So you, you want for there to be this variety. And I'd say, if you, if you have a great product, and in, in this case, as a case, if you have a great solution or suggestion, then that's ultimately what you want to have shine. So yes, you can have the polish, you can have the, the, the beautiful pizzazz, but I think there's a, there's a saying, and, and that is you, you can't put lipstick on a pig and expect it to, 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 to fly, right? So it's, it's, it's important to do the work in coming up with the recommendations or the solution and then present that with the requisite polish and sparkles and the confetti. That's it. You have to have the foundation. You have to have the nuts and bolts of the, of the pitch and the presentation before you can make it look great, right? Yeah. They're not going to fool you with sparkles and dazzling presentations <laughs> at the end as of the day. As, Is that what you're saying? As fun as sparkles are. <laughs> All right, you've heard it guys, the sparkles aren't gonna work. So, um, fantastic. Okay, we have one from Oscar. He says, of all the pitches and all of the presentations that you've seen, can you remember what the structure was of the best one? Um, like, was it simple? Does it kind of always hit certain marks for you? That's a great question. I would suggest that good, presentations will hit a whole bunch of marks, but they don't need to hit those marks in exactly the same order. Because I've been helping founders recently with some pitching and they've asked, is there a particular structure to use? And I'll say, it's good for you to talk about A, B, C and D, but you might talk about D first and then C, and then B, and then finish off with A. So I don't think you need necessarily to, to have things in a particular order, but what you need to do is anticipate what an uh, audience member might be thinking. And if, let's say, an audience member is wanting to, wanting to, to if the average audience member is, is wanting to perhaps know the name, of the company or the market, the size of the market or, or that type of information, I think if you can share that earlier, then that might allow them to be less distracted about that and then more, 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 more concentrated on, 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 your, on what you're trying to, to share. That's a great answer, yes. And you know, looking at it from the perspective of what's gonna be their concerns and what they wanna hear first. Really, really important. Okay, we've got time for a couple more guys. So if you have any to drop in, go ahead and do it now. I've got a couple on deck. Let's see how we go. All right, from Megu. Do you have any case study or business related video recommendations on like YouTube um, or anything like that? Yes, I think if you go to YouTube and do some searching for management consulting presentations or, or strong Microsoft presentation skills, I think you'll find a bunch of resources there. I, I, I can't remember the exact names right now, but if you, if you do search on YouTube, I know that there are either current or ex-consultants who have put up videos to explain how, how, to, how to create great slide decks. And perhaps my, my big suggestion is sketch 
first. So use the post-it notes or use a sheet of paper and a pen and draw up the tic-tac-toe grid, noughts and crosses grid, and have a shot at doing that first instead of getting onto your computer. Because I find that if I get onto the computer first and start drawing things up, I tend to go around in circles and perhaps get to to concerned with the alignment and the font color and all that type of stuff first instead of getting the structure and the logic right so i would suggest very much the preparation that you do on paper or on post-it notes or if you're collaborating with someone else on a miro do that first before you start baking your presentation Absolutely. There's nothing like a good old uh, pen and paper, right? <laughs> very, very useful. Very, yes, very, very old school. Um, okay, we have a question from Vichetta, and I think this is going to relate to the answer about um, focus on the sparkle last. Mm -hmm. um, but her question, or their question, is, is it a good idea to use transitions or animations in your slides? No. Un un unless there's a compelling, compelling reason, I would suggest to keep it very simple. And, and the reason is that the, the, the people that you're presenting to, particularly for this case competition, will be looking at stacks and stacks of presentations. And you don't know, I, I don't know what, whether they're going to be viewing them as a PDF or as a PowerPoint, I, I don't know. So if it's a PDF, it will just be flat anyway. But I was, I'd say keep things simple. Keep things really, really simple. Less of this, woo, fade in. Like that's a little bit unappealing. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the teams only have seven days to create their solutions and submit them. So, you know, you, you want to use your time the best way that you can. All right, we're going to take one last question, guys. This is the last one from Lila. Should we include a list of possible risks or is it a big turnoff? I think it's very important if you have identified risks with perhaps recommending a strategy, it's good to, good to identify those risks. And it's even better if you're able to suggest ways to mitigate or to reduce those risks. So I think any decision in life generally comes with risks. Do I cross the street? Well, there's a risk you might get run over by a bus, but we think that risk these days is quite low. So we cross the street very regularly. And I think there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's probably uh, a way that you're highlighting, you've thought through some of the risks and also the ways that you could mitigate the risks. So going back to crossing the street, well, maybe if it's a busy street, it's best to cross at the traffic lights because it's more likely that the bus will not go through the traffic lights if it's red and the pedestrians are crossing. That's it. I like to call them educated risks. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Ben. I know that has helped so many competitors. Um, we've had tons of questions and, and comments in the chat. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, just to give you another opportunity, everybody get your phones out again, take a picture of the screen. Um, these are our upcoming dates. So just be aware you would have received an email with all of these dates on it. Um, it also includes all of the links to all of the upcoming um, workshops, all of the dates, all of the details. Um, bear with us, guys. You know, with a global competition, we've got lots of time zones um, all over the place, as you can see things happening around the world all at the same time. Um, but that is one of the coolest things about TGCC. So now, from here, so in about an hour, so uh, actually an hour and 10 minutes from now exactly, um, we are going to have a live question and answer session with the, C the CFO of ACSL, the case study company. 
So really exciting. Make sure you go grab a snack, um, you know, maybe a, a coffee for those of you that's the middle of the night, uh, maybe some dinner for those that are in the APAC region, but make sure that you come back and you tune in um, to the live Q&A with the CFO. Um, the link is in the email that you received. And if you don't have it, you can message us on any of the social media, um, as well as the info at caseconf.org um, email inbox. So the rest of the dates you have as well. If anybody has any, has any, if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. Reach out by social media, reach out by email. We are here for you. It is so exciting. We are about 48 hours into the launch of CGCC 2020. Um, we're just really thrilled that you guys are all here with us. Um, everybody go get a snack. We'll see you soon for, um, for the next webinar. And thank you so much, Ben, um, from myself, from the TGCC committee, and from all the participants. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, and this, this workshop was just invaluable. It's going to help so much. Thank you for having me and good luck to everybody. Amazing. Thank you, Ben. Have a great night. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for coming.